Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. It's great to be here, and I want to thank the Heartland Institute for inviting me. I've been at a majority of these conferences and have spoken most of the times so I've been here. Uh, it's great to be, of course, out of Washington, D.C., but it's also great to catch up with a lot of people I've gotten to know over the years, many of whom I met here at this conference, and also to meet some new people. So uh, thank you all for coming. I'm the odd man out on this panel. I'm talking about some Obama administration policies. Now, the most serious climate policies stem from the failed cap-and-trade bill, the Waxman-Markey bill. But uh, there are others. And of course, I, I think we probably should have had a panel on those, the EPA regs. The, there are EPA regs for existing power plants, new power plants, and for automobile uh, mileage. And these are uh, very serious, and they're going to do a lot of damage to the economy if they're all implemented. The, the CAFE regs for cars have been implemented, 54.5 miles per gallon. By 2025, we'll all be driving tiny little cars or keeping old ones going forever. We'll look more and more like Cuba. Uh, but uh, I want to talk today about some other policies, and I think there are only a couple people in the room. Uh, one of them, Jerry Hillier, knows more about some of them than I do, so you might want to talk to him, uh, coming out of the Department of the Interior. And these have to do, uh, let me just say, uh, this is the famous New Yorker cartoon that CEI promotes everywhere because it sort of sums up, uh, I think, with a problem, one of the major problems with the environmental movement. Something's just not right, our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. I think that, uh, that caption is worth a fair amount of, uh, of meditation because uh, it does tell us something about the advantages of modern industrial civilization and modern energy. But I want to talk about what the Department of the Interior is up to because CEI is, uh, I should mention, I'm, I'm chairman of a group called the Cooler Heads Coalition. Heartland Institute is a member. Many of the nonprofit groups here are members. Uh, CEI sort of runs it. And we have a weekly Cooler Heads Digest, which you should have gotten. And if you didn't, I have some more. It's a weekly email newsletter on mostly the politics, but also the economics and science a little bit of uh, energy and climate issues. Uh, but the uh, CEI is kind of the lead group in arguing, going way back into the 90s, that we should not be talking about mitigation of climate change. We should be talking about adaptation to environmental change and environmental challenge. And that this is, uh, whatever the future holds, whether it's global warming, global cooling, droughts, floods, uh, we have the uh, wherewithal, the technological ability, the wealth, and the energy to handle those challenges through adaptation. Well, of course, no good uh, proposal goes uh, without its opposite. And I should have, it should have occurred to me a long time ago that if we got somebody in like President Obama, we would actually turn adaptation into something that may be just as bad as mitigation. So uh, the start is the National Climate Assessment. And for example, the impacts in the South are, are increased heat, drought, and insect outbreaks, all linked to climate change, declining water supplies, reduced food supplies, and so on. So it's all bad, and that's the basis that they're going to now adapt to. So how are they going to do it? Well, there are a lot of federal land management overlays. There's every national forest and BLM uh, tenure management plan now has to include managing for climate change. The National Environmental Policy Act, there is draft guidance. It's never been made final, but there is draft guidance that every environmental impact statement for a major federal project has to include climate change. In March of last year, the Department of the Interior released the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plants Climate Adaptation Strategy. And in 2009, Secretary Salazar uh, created 22 landscape conservation cooperatives assisted by eight climate science centers. And the goal ultimately is to link the Endangered Species Act to climate change. Now just, we're out here in the West, I'm a Westerner, I'm, I'm up from uh, Oregon. Oregon is 50% federally owned. California is 45, 46, is that right? 40, somewhere in there. 
you'll notice Nevada is it's 87 percent federally owned. So every BLM and national forest plan will now include climate change and it's all bad. It means we need to produce less and pr preserve more. We need to get the producers off the land. Now in 2010, Nancy Sutley sent a memo around this draft guidance document, and it said that every environmental impact statement has to include the effects of climate change, and it's never been gone final, but now, lo and behold, it's already being enforced. On 26, 27 June, a federal judge in Colorado blocked an expansion of the Arch coal mine there on the grounds that they hadn't considered the social cost of carbon in their environmental review. So we already see that this adaptation strategy is having negative implications. Uh, the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plants Climate Adaptation Strategy, uh, I'll let you read that, but it, it basically says that it will guide all federal land management planning and it, it says that states and counties should apply it as well. It can't force them, but that, there will, that, will, that will be down the road. And it explicitly ties this strategy to landscape conservation cooperatives, which is a very long word, uh, long uh, thing. It's meant to sound very boring so people won't know how dangerous it is. And I'll get to that. So I, I have a little bit of verbiage here on the strategy. Uh, it has a lot of code words in it if you read the strategy, and they all mean more government control and less uh, freedom for citizens to do what they want. Uh, so it's a federal land use overlay over all land use planning in the United States. Now, in 2009, Secretary Salazar created, uh, through, through an order, he created eight climate science centers, and 22 landscape conservation cooperatives. Uh, the, the, the eight climate science centers have an, a national one back near Washington, D.C. that sort of guides them. And then here's how the world is uh, divided. You'll see the southwest one. It's headquartered at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And here are the people who belong to it or participate with it. Uh, the science principal investigator, that is the head of the science for this science center, is somebody that many of you may know, Jonathan Overpeck. Yes. The South Central one at the University of Oklahoma, the head of it is Barrington Moore. And we could go on. So the mission uh, is, uh, is to provide the region's resource managers with essential scientific knowledge and tools to anticipate and adapt to climate change. The Secretary also, uh, in this 2009 order, established 22 landscape conservation cooperatives. And the, these cooperatives, plus the science centers, were initially funded with, you remember the great uh, uh, stimulus package that President Obama put, put through Congress? Well, they got $88 million. I don't know how this stimulates the economy, but it does create a lot of jobs for bureaucrats. And uh, again, I have a lot of stuff on the LCCs, but I want to move on here. Uh, the key th thing is that managing these lands is increasingly complex and that these challenges transcend political and jurisdictional boundaries. That should set off alarm bells for everybody here. So what's the idea behind the LCCs? Global warming will cause habitats to move generally either north, northwards or upwards in elevation. To survive, animals and plants will have to migrate to these new habitats. And this means that land management planning for endangered and many non-endangered species will in include potential future habitats and corridors. In other words, this is putting the Endangered Species Act on steroids. And if you know, the Endangered Species Act is already a nightmare, right? So here are the landscape conservation cooperatives. There are 22 of them. You'll see that the, the desert one that we're in goes way down into Canada, 
uh, up north, the great northern one goes way up uh, down into Mexico. The great northern one goes way up into Canada. So uh, we have an international landscape conservation cooperative system. Here's the desert LCC. Uh, Las Vegas is just barely in it. It goes way, way down into Mexico. Uh, here are the participating institutions. And I'll ask Jerry, Jerry, have you found one of these LCCs that has uh, local elected officials or local business groups in it? Maybe one or two, right? Uh, no, I did a um, paper last year for the National Association of Counties, and I researched all 26 counties in the United States. And there's not one of them that has a representative from either local government or private landowners. Right. So here are all the groups that participate. I, I will, you can look at that later if you like. Now here's what, here's a species. That's the greater sage grouse. That's of great interest here in the West. Here's its habitat. It's rather large. In fact, in some states, they still have hunting season on the greater sage grouse. So how are we going to save a species like the greater sage grouse? Well, Northern Arizona University has a corridor design program. They were, are going to figure out how to save a lot of species from climate change in 50 years or 100 years. So here are the species for this project, particular project in Arizona. It's a lot of species they're going to provide a corridor for. There's an example of the two places that they have to figure out how to hook up the corridors. And here's kind of how they think. You've got a corridor uh, uh, between one habitat and a potential habitat in the future. And I'm going to go on one minute longer, Taylor. Uh, here's a more sophisticated version. This has not only buffer zones, it has outer and inner buffer zones and an interregional corridor. So you can see how sophisticated this thinking is. Uh, that's supposed to be a joke. Uh, and the Western Governors Association is in on this. They have a, an initiative on wildlife corridors. So what is all this about? Uh, one of the things it's about is implementing the Wildlands Project. The Wildlands Project is, was designed by Dave Foreman of Earth First to rewild North America, to take out human beings to, and to take out corridors, to take out the highways, rail lines, transmission lines, and pipelines, and rewild a very large percentage of the country. So that's where this actually comes from. So these are the guys you can thank for it. Uh, thank you very much.